The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me to the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Also, I want to thank Pat for the new fashion accessory this morning. I feel like I ought to be preaching about jets and stuff here, like I told him this morning. Uh, <coughs> I think I'm just trying to keep up, Pat, just trying to keep up. So. Luke chapter 15, I'll be reading verses 1 through 10. I'm trying not to pull it out and wipe my sweat off. Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we pause on a day that is mixed with celebration and the remembrance of tragedy, Lord, we pause in this place to know that you are our God. And that you are always calling us on in this journey of faith toward the fulfillment of your kingdom. And that, Lord, in calling us and in this journey, you speak to us through the pages of Holy Scripture. So now, Lord, we pray that we hear your words speaking to us. That we hear words calling us to do what you call us to do. That we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it was kept behind the counter in the principal's office at College Street Elementary School when I was a kid. At some point in its earlier days, it probably held a new microwave or some other small kitchen appliance like a bread maker. It was just a simple cardboard box with a piece of orange construction paper taped to one side and written on that piece of paper were three words lost and found. The contents of that box were never really too impressive. Most of the time it was stuff like a comb, you know, one of those that said unbreakable, that some second grader had tried to prove wrong. Sometimes there were a pair of sunglasses with an absent lens, a box of broken crayons missing half the colors, or maybe even, maybe, maybe even a forgotten Tupperware lid some kid had forgotten in the lunchroom. Most of the time, it seemed that the lost and found box was just a halfway house of sorts, a pit stop for items on their way to the trash can. There were those times, however, when a student would wander into the office, fingers crossed, hoping, hoping so that he wouldn't get in trouble when he got home. And he asked the secretary, maybe, just maybe, did you find my retainer in the lunchroom? Did you find my wallet? I find my wallet on the playground. Because you see, there, those times are few and far between because most often in the lost and found box, it's a little more than a little empty cardboard shell containing broken, forgotten items, things children simply leave behind. Broken, forgotten things gathering dust in a box stashed on the floor under the counter in the principal's office. We learn from the lost and found box that not everything we lose is something we hope to find. Not everything that is lost has someone searching for it. 
And the same can be said for those people that we like to label with the word lost. Those people who find themselves in that little box in humankind, the lost and found. Like a long forgotten item rattling around in the bottom of a cardboard box, those individuals are often just sort of overlooked, forgotten, pushed to the periphery of society, overlooked and purposefully ignored. And throughout history, we found ways to justify our overlooking those we've named lost. Those we have no real desire to find. We've deemed them incorrigible, lazy, less than human. We've called them sinners. We've tried to justify placing our fellow humans in the lost and found through economics, politics, sociology, psychology, and probably most egregiously and yes, most common of all, religion. Our sinful habit of ignoring our brothers and sisters and life's lost and found is nothing new. So it shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you to find Jesus was often in, in the middle of these kinds of people, the ones rejected by society and a misguided religion. And it really shouldn't shock us too terribly when we hear how the people in these uh, societal and religious circles responded to Jesus in his relationship with those people. We have before us today in the Bible, in the text we've read, a clear example of those two things. Luke tells us all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And so what should happen? The Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners, neats with them. Now, in case you're unaware, the tax collectors and sinners were some of those people that the Pharisees and scribes understood to be not just unclean, not just impure, not just uh, unworthy, but they were traitors. They were people who had walked out not only on their people but on God. They looked at them, sinners and tax collectors. They were those people. You know who those people are, don't you? You sit across from someone in the restaurant and overhear them say something like, well, you know, I like him just fine, but he's one of those people. Or maybe you've heard someone say, I wouldn't let one of those people near my family. I wouldn't let one of those people touch my food. I wouldn't let one of those people into my house. I don't want one of those people coming to my church. Maybe you've heard something like that. Maybe. Maybe the voice you heard saying those sorts of things was your own. Either way, it was with that sort of sentiment that these Pharisees and scribes had when they were talking about these tax collectors and other sinners that Jesus had at his dinner table. Those people. And to these Pharisees and scribes, Jesus was guilty by association. And so it's in response to this criticism from these established religious leaders that Jesus responds with three stories. We've only heard the first two this morning. Responding to the remarks from the Pharisees and scribes about his habit of eating with the lost and found folks, Jesus says, which one of you, having a hundred sheep, loses one of them and then leaves the ninety-nine in the wilderness alone? And goes after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. The second story is just like the first. A woman has ten silver coins, loses one of them. Ten drachmas, about ten days wages, loses one of them. Jesus says, Does she not light a lamp? Sweep the house, search carefully till she finds it, and when she has found it, calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now I have to tell you, on the surface, these two stories seem pretty simple. You've probably heard them a lot. A sheep, a common image in that part of the world, an, uh, an image Jesus uses often, wanders off from the flock. Doesn't seem all that important. After all, there are 99 more just like it that all decided to stay together, that all did the right thing, 
that all did what they were supposed to do. Ninety-nine who were doing what they were supposed to do as sheep, and they all stayed together. But one got away. That one, however, seems important enough for one to trek out into the thicket, away from the flock, in order to recover it. And not only does Jesus say it's worth finding, but when it's found, the one who found it calls all of his friends together to rejoice. They're going to have a I found my lost sheep party. You ever been to one of those? Seems a bit excessive, really. I have to be honest. It seems a bit excessive. But to the shepherd who truly loves his flock, the shepherd who knows each of his sheep as his own, such a joyful act needs no rational explanation. Then there's a story about this woman and her coin. Perhaps she set it on the kitchen table after coming home from the grocery store, and her cat thought it was some little plaything, just sort of flicked it off the table. Perhaps she tucked it in her mattress with the rest of her savings and simply forgot about it. Maybe, like so many of us in our homes, she set it down in one place, only the next day to find it's just gone. Just gone, mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Whatever the case may be, she had nine other coins just like it. Nine drachmas, nine days' wages. That's not a bad sum of money. Nine days' wages. She lost one, but she still had nine. So why fool with looking for one singular coin? Why fool with it? It'll turn up eventually, right? I mean, it's not gone anywhere. Maybe somebody took it, and if they did, maybe she had the attitude of, well, they needed it more than I did. So why, why fool with it? But according to Jesus' story, this woman wants to find this coin so desperately that she lights a lamp. Homes in those days weren't really well lit, just a, just a room with a dirt floor, one small door, maybe a window. you got to light a lamp even in the middle of the day. She lights the lamp, breaks out the broom, moves all the furniture, begins to sweep the house looking for that coin. Then like the shepherd who finds his one lost sheep, she invites all of her friends and neighbors together to celebrate finding this singular coin. I can imagine when she sent out the invitations, none of them were all that thrilled to go to an I found my lost coin, let's celebrate party. But it's all that celebrating. That's what gets me. All that celebrating. Think about it. If you walked into your parking lot, after the, out of the parking lot, after church today, opened the door to your car, and there you saw it, tucked down in that no man's land between the console and the seat. There it was. That five you lost. That quarter that, that got away when you were at McDonald's. If you found it, would you, would you all of a sudden say, hey, everybody, before you get in your car, come on over to my house. We're going to have a I found my quarter lunch. No, you ain't going to do that. And if you do, I ain't coming. I'm sorry. I'm just, unless you got something good, I shouldn't say that. But, of course, I don't, I don't doubt any of us would do such a thing. I bet none of us would do it even if we found 100 under the floor mat. We'd want to keep that quiet. I found that 100. What if your dog or cat ran away this morning? Getting ready for church, you let the dog out, open the door, whistle for it, doesn't come back. Whistle more, holler, it's not there, it doesn't come back. Some of you may, may rejoice if the cat's gone, I don't know. But what, what if it's gone? Your cat or dog ran away. And then when you find it tomorrow, would you call the church office, ask Peggy to add an announcement in the bulletin about your I found my cat going through the neighbor's trash party? Of course not. Of course you wouldn't do that, unless, unless those things were so important to you, so important to you, so valuable to you, that you would stop at nothing to find them if they were lost. So let's tweak that story just a little bit. Let's bring Jesus' story a little closer to the bone for us. Let's say you were walking with your child, your grandchild, your cousin, your nephew, something like that, at Walmart. And before you know it, they've let go of your hand, and they're out of your sight, off in an unknown direction, and you can't find them. What would you do? You'd run all over the place looking for that child. No matter how many more you had at home, no matter how many more were sitting in the buggy, you'd run all over that place, wouldn't you? Why, why you'd topple over strangers' buggies. I'm sorry, i got to find my young one. Throw the eggs, throw the bread. You're looking for them. You'd topple sales display. You'd go through every door marked employees only. And when you found your lost child, your heart would be so filled with this mixture of relief and joy. Joy. 
We rejoice when we find something we've lost. When it's something we value. When it's something we will miss. Something that would never be left behind in a cardboard box. Labeled lost and found. And that, I think, is where we find the depth of these two little anecdotes from Jesus. Because do you remember Jesus' other words from this passage? The words he says after he tells each of these two stories. They're near echoes of each other. In verses 7 and 10, he says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then verse 10, Just so I tell you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Joy in heaven, in the presence of God and the angels over one sinner. Joy over finding one of those people. The joy doesn't come from what we deem to be an adequate response. A shepherd doesn't rejoice over finding one sheep because all the people on the uh, the village think that that one sheep is wonderful. A woman doesn't rejoice over finding her lost coin because all her friends and neighbors thought that that coin was just so marvelous that she had to find it. Just so, the joy in heaven doesn't come from some idea we have of who is or who isn't worthy of such divine celebration. A shepherd rejoices at finding his lost sheep Because that shepherd loved that sheep. Because that shepherd deemed it worthy of his joy. A woman rejoices at finding her lost coin, not because everybody else thought it was special, but because that woman valued that coin so highly and wished to share her joy in finding it with all who would join her in that celebration. Just so the joy in the presence of God and of the angels in heaven comes from God, Loving those sinners, those people, and God rejoicing when those sinners, us, all of us, are found in the saving grace of his love and forgiveness. So while we may choose to ignore the refuse found rattling around in the bottom of the cardboard box of life's lost and found, while we may even find ourselves at times overlooked, forgotten, abandoned by others, God rejoices when we are found. God celebrates those moments when the tax collectors and sinners of our world, those people, are found trusting in his love and setting out to follow his son Jesus. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels and of God in heaven when those of us who have been lost, broken, found, forgotten, and abandoned are found, forgiven, restored, and made whole in the love of Christ. There is rejoicing when those who have been kept from the bounty of life's table are welcomed at the Lord's table and they eat. So as we gather now around Christ's table, the table of fellowship, the table of forgiveness, the table of thanksgiving, may we take the time to turn our hearts to God, to remove from our spirits the distractions that cause us to lose focus upon the all-welcoming love of God. As we come to the Lord's table, may we repent of the sins that have kept us from the table And perhaps more importantly, may we repent of our sins that have kept others from the table. May we repent of those sins that keep those people from the Lord's table. So as the deacons make their way forward to serve us from the table, would you join me as we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, the one who stops at nothing to find us when we are lost, when we are filled with joy. Lord, as we celebrate this day, the repentance and new life of our sisters and brothers who have gone through the waters of baptism. And as we are rejoicing, help us, God, to see what we, that we still stand in need of repentance ourselves. Grant us, Lord, the humility to repent of our own sins our sins that have drawn us farther from you, 
and our sins that have kept others away from you. Continue to love us and forgive us of our selfishness. For we know, Lord, that we cannot do it on our own. And that we do not deserve such love and forgiveness. Nor is there anything we can do to deserve it. We ask in this time when we are served from your table that you move in our midst. Speak to us and call our attention always to you and the work of your kingdom. Bless the bread, Lord. Bless the cup. Bless our time with your presence and the powerful reminder of your great love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.